Uh, dit is uh, het Engelse kanaal, kanaal 1. Dit is het Engelse kanaal, kanaal 1. Kanaal 1, Engels. Kanaal 1, Engels. Channel 1, English. Channel 1, English.
Hartelijk welkom. A warm welcome. Madam Chairperson of the Dutch Senate and also the Vice Chairperson of the Dutch Senate. You're both alumni of this university, so not bad. And then Jaap Smit of Executive of the Province. And thank you for being here today. The mayors and the aldermen of the neighboring cities and the mayor of The Hague and Leyde. Welcome to the executive board who are all here, the members of the order, the previous boards. Welcome to students, researchers, staff, doctors, teachers. And the students are now right in front of me. You used to be spread out across the church, but I want to keep an eye on you guys. And you've all come back from your holidays and many of you will now experience the first opening of the academic year. Ambassadors and other representatives of many befriended countries who have their embassies in The Hague. Most of this afternoon will be in English, um, but there will be translation in English. And if you are not connected yet, please raise your hands so that we can help you help you out. So all of you, a warm welcome and more particularly to all the speakers this afternoon. Leiden has a tradition of, well, I should say, of in the past few years not having many political speakers during the opening sessions, but we now invited one of our very own professors, one of the teachers at the De Hague School, and his name is Jaap de Hoop Scheffer. One of the most popular teachers is also invited. She is a very popular. He is very popular, and he will have a dialogue with Iman Mahrani, and I'm very proud of her as well. She is an alumni of this university, and she will have a dialogue with Jaap de Hoop Scheffer on Europe. That's what they'll talk about. Europe in an internationally changing world, a swiftly changing world, and it is a dialogue between a baby boomer and a millennial. The baby boomer is Yab and the millennial is Iman. So just so you know, they'll have this conversation, the two of them, on Europe, and they have half an hour's time for this. So we look forward to that. And many congratulations and also a warm welcome to the students who received a scholarship. 44 received the Leiden University Excellence Scholarship. We are very proud of these 44 students. And I also want to welcome the students of Augustinus and Quintus because they are here as a part of their introduction to this university. They have a full week of introductions and they are also here this afternoon. And the opening of the economic year is always a good occasion to tell you what we are about. Well, generally speaking, Leiden and The Hague are more popular than ever before. When we look at the numbers of new students for both Leiden and The Hague, both national and international students, especially for The Hague, by the way, Leiden is very popular. I can say this quite proudly, and I have some numbers here for you, so you get a bit of an idea. 150 students for criminology, 230 for public administration, and then literature students, we have 25, a grand new program as of today in The Hague, and these are African studies, 90 students for philosophy, to 18 history, 260 biopharmacy, 65 biomedical sciences, and some 220 medicine students, 750 lawyers. Oh, we can't have enough of those, can we? Some 50 people who will study Dutch and international studies in The Hague is very, very popular, as always. 
especially for international students who will go around the world after they graduate. Very, very popular. 400 first year students, just under 6,000 new students in Leiden. And then, of course, we have the master students. So, as I said, very popular university indeed. And we will start with this program and we'll start with the dialogue, as mentioned. I look forward to this. I certainly do. As I said, they have about half an hour to speak, and I can give you an introduction of these speakers, but if you look in your booklet, on page six, there is an introduction, but what I'd like you to do is give them a warm hand, and then I will introduce the other speakers, but first of all, welcome Ja, and welcome Iman. When Iman and I, uh, my house, were getting together to discuss this, our chat, the baby boomer and the millennial, I'm so pleased that somebody explained it, uh, who was which. When we talked about uh, this attempt to have a dialogue uh, within and beyond the borders, she said, do you know what the gladiole is, Yap? Well, I know what gladiola I am. I know about the Nijmegen four-day march and the Via Gladiola. I, uh, of course, remember what uh, Louis van Gaal said when he was trainer of Man uh, United, the death or the gladioles, he said. But the website was something new for me. That's what I answered to him. I'm, um, she uh, gave me a sort of a weak smile, one of my excellent uh, students and uh, assistant students. She said, let me give you a hand here, yeah. Google it. And when you come to that site, you'll see that uh, your generation is um, looked at very critically. You've not got any uh, study uh, loan. You bought a cheap house. And you paid off your uh, mortgage, got a nice pension, and then she carried on. When it comes to your specialist area, international relations, that is something that would be discussed on this website, the Gladiol. How, well, what would the world look like when you baby boomers leave it behind? That's the question I want to answer today. Well, just as well, says Imam, that we are good friends because otherwise uh, maybe we would have had a bit of a quarrel because the 50-plus party, the rich baby boomers, it says, the rich baby boomers, boomers have a right to feel sorry for themselves. Well, you know, I have been less friendly to Yab about his age, I must tell you the truth, but it is a good example for the kind of interaction or lack of interaction between our two generations. The baby boomers are not usually all that positive about the younger generations. The millennials, for instance, are often told that they don't know the value of hard work, that they are not politically involved, that they're spoiled, so that's not very nice either, is it? And it's not a productive debate either. The reality is that if we want to have an intergenerational dialogue about the future of Europe, which is coming up, we have to have this type of discussions. We really have to. In earlier discussions, you often ask me the question, what my generation feels about the Brexit. And I understand why the no deal Brexit question is put to me by you, because I'm 25 years old. I'm both from Leiden and from London. I'm politically conscious. And it's a good question, but let me tell you a little bit about how I feel about Europe. The entering into force of the Maastricht Treaty is 17 days older than I am. 
the benefits of the European Union always played a major role in my life. Until I was 17 years old, my family and I would drive from Leiden, no borders, to Algeciras in Spain to go across to Morocco. And my first set of euros I remember quite clearly, but not my final Dutch guilders. As many other Dutch students, I went to another EU country to study there in 2015, a master in international migration. My generation is so used to packing a backpack or a rolling suitcase to go to London, Madrid, Naples, Oslo. That is my Europe. Today's Europe is under pressure. The migration crisis, climate change, violations of human rights, the threat of liberal values. It is quite a burden, isn't it, on the shoulders of young people. So the question I want to put to you, Yab, is why have my generation, the people of my generation and I, inherited Europe in this state? How did you leave Europe and the world behind for us? Well, Iman, I'm going to attempt to answer your question. I think I can express it as how will you oldies, you don't actually use that word, but that's what you're meaning, and you're quite right. How will you, oldies, uh, will you oldies leave the world? Not in a particularly good state, I reckon, is the answer, because it's unpredictable, it's too hot, there are cracks in the multilateral system, and constant attacks on the structure of human rights. World leaders with excessive egos and hubris, and as the old Greeks taught us, that is not a good start. The main players, well, let's have a look at them. The US is abandoning its leadership position consciously under the leadership of a president who seems to have forgotten Winston Churchill. During the Second World War, in a speech at Harvard, he confronted his American audience with the, the, the statement, the price of greatness is responsibility. And that's true. But now we have make America great again. Well, that's fine. But you have to do this with the appropriate responsibilities for an international rule of law. You don't have to be a specialist in law to understand how things sound. China, the Middle Kingdom, has great ambitions to turn the world to suit itself with an intelligent combination of what we call soft, smart, and if necessary, hard power. Just travel in Asia or Africa and you'll see what I mean. Building roads, yes, but you have to be cautious because in China, the state is always present, always watching, always watching very closely, especially in academia. China is not an enemy, but is certainly a rival. Russia, outraged and assertive and sometimes aggressive in its quest to redress the major geopolitical catastrophe linked to the destruction of the Soviet Union. The quote is from Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Europe, you asked me about Europe. My Europe, Iman, we have a lack of self-confidence and we're acting as a magnet for the projection of many forms of social unease. You asked me about my legacy and I must say that over the last years, Europe has also slipped through my fingers, if I can put it that way. I began to see these things as self-evident, thinking that the Nie wieder Krieg, never in the future will there be war, which my generation got from our parents, that that would be enough to keep this unique project in place and to expand it. It became just part of my political furniture. 
a comfy chair. However, what I didn't realise, or didn't realise quickly enough, was that some people didn't find this comfortable chair as comfortable as I did. So now we see an EU which is not protecting sufficiently, which is leading to the urge to taking back control. If the EU doesn't protect me enough, then I'll start turning the buttons to see if I can adjust it. We see that we don't have in the EU the ability to get to grips with a number of challenges, migration, climate change, and the attack on core values. Migration as a result of conflict and war, but first and foremost as a result of the uh, demographics of the African continent, more than a billion in 2050, by which time you'll be, eight, you'll be 58, Iman. Combine that with climate change, which is going to make the continent or parts of it uh, unsuitable for human habitation. And then last but not least, the question of values. For my generation, but even more so for your generation, this is going to be an essential part of the discussion. There's an almost cultural revolution emanating from alt-right champion Steve Bannon and the self-declared illiberal Democrat Viktor Orban. They seem to have come together in an attack on something which I hope all of us here today will recognize and wish to protect, the rule of law, capital R, capital L. This cultural revolution, as Bannon calls it, is, in my uh, eyes, a greater threat to the EU and its future than Brexit, no matter how dramatic that is, is in itself. I tend to agree with Ian Burma, the current uh, editor-in-chief of the New York Review books, that uh, the signals that these self-declared illiberal Democrats seem to be giving off increasingly strongly as perhaps things that we are not recognizing and realizing how strong they are. In a recent uh, article in NRC Handelsblatt, he uh, compared the situation with the 1930s and asked, can this happen to us? And in countries with a democratic tradition, as he said, it would be nice to think, no, it couldn't happen to us. But I would be wary of hasty conclusions. I found this a very difficult uh, comparison. But if you look at political and uh, social resistance, then there are definitely points of comparison between then and now. So, uh, I'm sure your answer to what I'm saying is not going to be we're standing on the sidelines watching what happened, but your millennials will realize that they do have the ability to take control. So, the question is, do you want to take control and how? I'm very happy that you asked me this because I think it shows the difference between our generations. We're often reproached, why are we not interested in politics? In excess of 70% of young Brits that voted did not want the Brexit, but too many youngsters did not vote. And across the big pond, many young people voted for Clinton, but then there were more over 40s who voted for Trump, etc. What we often do not include in these analyses is what does political participation mean for you? What does it mean for me? I'll admit there is a lack in traditional political participation among youngsters, such as voting or becoming a member of a political party. This is a trend that we see throughout Europe. However, for a generation that is was raised with a pacifier in one hand and a mobile phone in the other hand, political participation is very different. And, Yab, you are not 
uh, literate in digital matters because you know about media. I can even tell you, or I even showed you how to do with Netflix, and I helped you to copy paste on your laptop. But, but I can tell you that the millennial or the generation Z's political activities are maybe not visible to you because this new generation has political consciousness. The Central Bureau of Statistics surveys show that young people are more politically active than people of your generation, but in so many different ways. New media, for instance, is used a lot by youngsters for activistic goals. And to get back to those values that you talked about, our generation has a different connection to what was referred to by Ion Burma in that newspaper. Our generation grew up in a society in which the values for Europe were the standards. We're not the generation that has the knee we the Krieg, we never want war again. No, we are the generation of a study trip to Germany, we study a year in Dublin, and we go to Dubrovnik for a week, we have a city trip to Denmark. Young people throughout Europe have a much more positive opinion on migration than of older people. We have always lived in a democracy, and especially those who will follow us, our successors, will have voting age in times of enormous pressure. And we see the signals, don't worry, climate change, migration crisis, democratic values that are under pressure in the mid and eastern parts of Europe. A Trump across the Atlantic Ocean that attacked just about all our standards and values. We were comfortable with the benefits of the European Union, but now we are grown-ups and we are confronted with the threats of the values that made the European Union necessary. Ian Baruma wrote, life would be easier if the world seems normal, even if we see the, the, that the contrary is true. This world is not normal for us. The burden on our shoulders is so heavy that it is sometimes even paralyzing. But yet, it has mobilized us, not in the conventional ways that you are used to, but in important ways. And that's how we can enhance one another. Let's not declare a crisis in civil citizenship among young people. No, let's see how we can enhance our understanding of political participation and involve more and more people because many young people do not feel represented by an aging group of politicians. The many young people that I work with in the Prince's Trust in London, mainly in sink estates and with complex backgrounds, they're not, they are politically conscious, sorry, they are, but they do not feel any connection with the representation in the government. And do you blame them? No, the average age in the British House of Commons is 50, and in the House of Representatives it's 45. Many young people want to guarantee their human rights. No, they don't want to have fewer migrants in the United Kingdom, and even though that is what has a priority of Theresa May. We've got to do something about this. We've got to work harder in political activities. Your generation, sorry, is overrepresented in politics, so you have to pass on the baton to us, and my generation must be ready to accept the baton. So how can we fill the gap? Well, that's a good question, Iman. The reason I'm here today as an oldie, as you put it, working hard for you, your and my alma mater, which I do with pleasure, I have to say, is easy to explain. And I think that I have to agree with you there. Both our generations see each other, but we don't talk to each other enough. And the result of that is that we tend to wallow in our conviction that we're right far too easily. I learn just as much from my students as I hope, at least, that my students learn from me. And I hope that they, that you, you, Iman, you hear students here today, will think about 
and think together with the value of our state within our borders and beyond our borders. We need to think about the protection of human rights, for example, for the importance of the rule of law. And I can tell you from my uh, own experience, these things just don't happen of their own accord. They need to be maintained. We're failing. My generation is failing in the social debate because of our inability to contradict ourselves. I have attended enough seminars and panels which have just ended in self-congratulation relating to Project Europe or migration. And I think you can say that we are lucky that our society here is not as polarized as in the US, but nevertheless, in the Netherlands, with regard to topics such as uh, migration and Europe, we do have this division, and we do have people claiming on both sides that they are right. Presidium Libertatis is not simply a motto, not simply the motto of the oldest university of this country. We are one of the most successful countries in the world, and it is up to us to accept our obligation to be a bulwark of freedom where we can have a cutting-edge debate about the need to have a balance between receive and transmit to cover all ideas. Is this self-evident? I, I fear that it's not. Also, in our country, the current political situation means that it's very difficult for everybody. Am I going too far? Well, from my perspective, every dialogue, debate or discussion on every pertinent question is there is a lack of nuance and understanding, especially thanks to the influence of digital media and their algorithms. It's so easy to surround yourself with people who think exactly the same as you do and get rid of the others who don't think like you do. But I do think it is a good development that the younger generations can position themselves better in society. And we are inclined to be individualistic. Generally speaking, people are very much inclined to oversimplification, which could obstruct positive and productive debates. And to have that intergenerational dialogue, I think that you must recognize the interest of the individualization and positioning. The identity politics. And even though we now pay more attention to the gaps in society, maybe we haven't paid enough attention to the intergenera intergenerational gap. And we can learn a lot from that. We will need self-reflection. We'll need to be willing to have a dialogue with people whose opinions and key values may not be the same as yours. The lack of nuance makes that you can very easily say something wrong. The when there is an insensitive tweet or a Facebook comment, that's often the end of the dialogue. But at the opening of the year of the oldest university of the Netherlands, I think that we should not condemn somebody else's answer, but be open to putting the right questions and to be open to the learning process. Well, Iman, I have to say, I have faith in your uh, generation. And I would ask you to keep us keep us up to speed with your gladioli or whatever other websites you come up with. Contradict me. Contradict us if that's necessary. And you've done that this afternoon very clearly and very politely already. If I quote... There would, that there is, if there is no contradiction, there is no discussion. You need to work to build a powerful Europe that will protect its uh, citizens and keep plugging away at the maintenance that I referred to earlier. It is so important today. There have been problems. 
I have seen them in my past, and therefore I would ask you and your generation to accept the challenge. And the, I'm looking also at the young students in front of me now. Accept the challenge. Pick up the gauntlet. And if you help me to carry on copying and pasting, you won't hear me talk about the uh, generation gap. She sent me this, and the subject line when she sent this text was, Yap is still a digital illiterate. Thank you very much. Uh, Iman, I know where I am, comfortable at my age, but thank you very much for taking up the challenge and discussing this with me today.
On the piano, Louis Lalouette. On piano, Louis de Lalouette.
Temper, jullie zijn weer beter dan ooit. Great. Better than ever, which is also what your name says. But no, no, no. First of all, Guido, Louis, you did really well. The choir, Jaap, Imen, wonderful. And the chair of the Dutch Senate said, this is great to have this kind of intergenerational debate. So we'll think about this. It might be a good idea for future occasions. And now we have a different part of the program, which is almost fully dedicated to education. Hester Bell will first speak on the educational challenges today, and then Guilherme will award the teaching award, and at the opening we often have this emphasis on education, and then the cult award. One of my predecessors long time ago, and I'll introduce him a little bit further, or introduce you know, wh who he was a bit further, I will award the Cut Award to one of you here. But Hester, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carol. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is changing. In the past time, we saw this in the world and world politics. We've seen many changes that are still also current. Jaap de Hoopscheffer and Iman have made us more aware of this. Mondialization is increasing and the interests of the major powers are shifting. In addition to internationalization, we see increased digitalization and flexibilization, and our society is becoming increasingly more diverse. The students who study at a university now will contribute in the future to this changing world. Leiden University has a huge tradition in studying languages and cultures around the world. We're strong in international right and in social, behavioral, and data studies and medicine. And that is why our university is very well prepared for its students. The knowledge that in a further globalization of the world will become increasingly more relevant. Our graduates will have to be able to use their skills in an international context. And there is quite a chance that they will have to communicate with colleagues and customers, clients from other countries. And a good way to prepare them to this are our international classrooms. Many of our masters and some of our bachelor courses provide in these international classrooms. These international classrooms is where students from various nationalities, cultures, and religions, religions meet and work together. And of course, our students also go out into the world, and they use the many opportunities for traineeships and studies abroad. For instance, in an Erasmus Plus exchange program. And we want them to do that. We encourage them to do this. And an exchange is possible at some courses virtually through our virtual exchange program. As I said, the world is changing. Old professions disappear and new come in their stead, such as web editor, online security specialist, data analyst, blogger. That's not new in itself, is it? But what is new is that the changes are increasingly more fast. Research shows that in some 20 years, almost half of the current jobs will no longer exist. And the professions that will still exist will be different. Most graduates have careers of which they didn't know anything when 
they started their studies. They didn't know that this was going to be their future. And today, some eight and a half thousand first year master and bachelor students start cheerfully, and some 20,000 seniors start also their new study year. And where this will take you, you have to wait for the future. Even though you do have some ideas, you have some dreams and aspirations, and keep those, please. But that doesn't mean that you cannot know today exactly what knowledge will be relevant later on in life and what skills you have to learn to be able to do the work that will showcase your talents at its best. And that's why, dear students, it is important that from the beginning of your studies, you have a broad orientation on your future on the labor market, that you discover all the possibilities, that you realize that work changes, job change often, and that there are new requirements time and time again. What type of work does suit you and what type of work is not the right work for you? And you can do this by being actively involved. For instance, to use the opportunity in your course to discover your interests and to develop your talents. Broadly, for instance, by taking a fully different minor or more deeply. And I also advise you to, during your study time, have a look at your intended future field of work to get some experience during a traineeship or a research product project to contact alumni via our alumni network to talk to potential interesting employees and with the Leiden University Career Zone website you can independently work on your career skills. That's not all though a good orientation on the labor market. We do know that society will be different in many aspects than it is today but we do not know how it will be different and yet our training, our courses have to be in such a way that it prepares you optimally to be able to continue to contribute to this changing society. So what does that mean for our university? At any rate, it means that academic knowledge is still very important, but also that academic and other skills is increasingly more important. And that is why we train our students to acquire academic skills. We allow them to do their research themselves and to think critically. We challenge our students to be creative and to develop their problem-solving skills. That's not new in itself, but what is new is the importance of these skills for our students to make this explicit and to also show the increasing interest of other skills such as entrepreneurship and digitalization and globalization skills. I may be wrong, but I often feel that we, as a training institute, we don't have to worry about your digital skills. Students are usually so handy that the teachers and I learn more from you than the other way around. And the digital revolution offers wonderful new opportunities. And we also take part in those. At our university, we develop types of innovative online teaching that are in line much and much better with the individual students' wishes, entry level, study speed, learning styles, and individual study process. And also, we pay attention to what the results will be of digitalization for the future of your field of study. And I can hear you think, you have to do all that as well? We have to go to lectures, tutorials. We have to do research, write theses and papers and reports. We have to do traineeships. So we also have to already start looking into the labor market and take the extra mile, go the extra mile 
for the right skills. Yes, dear students, you have to do this, even though you are tremendously busy. Over 60% of the Dutch students feel that they have stress to perform, and a quarter of them have burnout syndrome, which is a very serious problem, which we do not underestimate. But there is no simple solution for this problem, unfortunately. What we can do, however, is to take this seriously and to try and help our students who experience this stress as well as possible, to support them and to help them deal with this, and to make sure that they get the skills that will help them also after their study. Students can go to one of the student psychologists, and we have training sessions and workshops on teaching students how to deal with the study stress, but we want to do more. So briefly, before the summer period, or just before the summer period, we have set up a task force, Student Welfare, to advise us in regard of this. We offer not just challenges, but structure, continuity, and we make clear what the requirements are that you have to meet. The recent announcement of the minister about a future amendment to the binding stu study recommendation doesn't help and it's a total surprise to universities and creates unrest in the world of academe which doesn't make it reduce stress but increase stress and we will have a good look at what we have to do and we will discuss this with the relevant parties dear students you have to meet a lot of requirements as does your university, of course. And as a result of this, the pressure to perform can go up to unacceptable levels, both for students and teachers. So these are major challenges. Challenges, by the way, are very popular with bloggers. One of those new jobs, professions that I just mentioned. For instance, the ice bucket challenge. Those of you who do not go to YouTube every day will know about this. You pour a bucket, bucket of ice cubes over you. It's not so nice. It's quite unpleasant, but hey, done after a minute. You film it, put it on YouTube, Bob's your uncle. The challenges in education that we face are more long term. And they require a lot more knowledge and creativity. But there's more at stake, isn't there? If we, together with you, esteemed teachers and students, if we challenge or manage to face these challenges, we will make a major contribution to the future. Dear students, each and every one of you follows his, her own path during your study. And about all of you will have to face setbacks, problems, uncertainties, but that is required for development. It is necessary for progress. In my discipline, aerodynamics, we say without resistance there is no progress. But at the end of the day, just about everyone will find his or her own path and then Sooner or later, there will be the happy day that you can sign your degree certificate. And that's what we'll work about and work towards in this new year with new energy. And I wish you all, especially our teachers, our students, a very inspiring and successful year at our university. Okay, thank you, Al Hester. Thank you, Hester. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, a large number of lecturers were put forward as candidates for the Leiden Teaching Prize. And we spent a lot of time sneaking into lectures to listen to some of these candidates. 
and there are three lecturers who have got the uh, highest uh, level and um, I would like to speak to you today. I'm very pleased to see you here today. I sent you an email to say that you were on the list, that you were nominated, but you almost didn't come here today because you all three of you thought it was a spam email. A tip for Ninka, my successor, do not start your email with, congratulations, you have been selected as a potential candidate for 25,000 euros. But we managed to conquer this. Perhaps I could say a few words about what this teaching prize uh, actually involves. The winner, one of the three people in front of me, wins a, a 25,000 euro grant and is also inducted into the Leiden Teachers Academy because uh, most people here are not as familiar with you as I am. I think it'd be a good idea for me to give a quick introduction to everybody, to you. And I'd like to start with uh, Maya Berkens and her students describe her as an empathetic student and she understands that some Dutch students are more familiar with the way we teach than international students and she takes account of the requirements and potential of her students. She has complicated case studies in her lectures and there are many students who are very, very keen to part, be part of her teaching because she understands what they need, challenges. That is the way they're going to learn. She's been described as a fantastic uh, teacher, but they also mention her humor, her sense of humor. And she is uh, extremely enthusiastic. Uh, the next uh, lecture I'd like to present to you is our mathematician, Robert Jan Coleman, from the uh, Faculty of Maths and Sciences. Maths is a subject that doesn't really develop as fast as some other areas, which means that there's not a lot of room for variation. Despite his subject area not changing, Mr. Coleman nevertheless tries very hard to develop himself and his students. He is always there for them. One of his students told me that he uh, checks all the mock exams to make sure that his students have understood the subject. And then he concentrates on the areas where there seem to be problems. Checking M mock exams is something he could have left to one of his assistants, but no, for him, it's a point of honor. The students who followed, I spoke to a student who followed linear algebra, and I asked him what it was like, and he said, if there was no Coleman, I would never have understood this subject. But when it, he managed to get my enthusiasm up for this particular subject, I realized that he would have been a worthy, he would be a worthy winner of the prize. And thirdly, we come to Roland Dex of the LUMC. He's a very modest man who doesn't really know, seem to know why he's such a popular lecturer, but he's, it is just this uh, modesty he works to help the students. They tell him what their problems are and he teaches them how to overcome them. And he tries to get other students to provide the uh, missing solutions. 
But that doesn't mean he sort of leans back in his chair and puts his feet up. On the contrary, we recently saw some, well, when we recently showed him some pictures of one of his lectures, he fell about laughing. He was never there. He was just dashing around the room to make sure that other people were answering the things they could answer. They refer to his inexhaustible and infectious enthusiasm. The way he teaches seems to them to be a one-to-one -one personal conversation, which is quite difficult if you have a very full lecture hall. So, ladies and gentlemen, those are our three uh, nominated candidates. Each is unique in his or her own way, but we can only have one winner today. During the final selection process, the Leiden University student platform came quickly to one answer, as well as the passion. We looked also at the research ideas that this uh, lecturer had and it was entirely devoted to students. The LUS described his idea as efficient, money-saving, and environmentally friendly. So it's a great pleasure for me to be able to contribute to implementing the innovative plan to set up a digital laboratory by presenting the 2018 Teaching Prize to Roland Dirks. And once more for luck for the photo. Oh, I'm very pleased to have the chance to say something. I'm also from a slightly older generation, but I'm uh, very pleased to have a lot of younger uh, students here who keep me up to speed. And I would like to thank uh, everybody, first for the nomination, because that was a complete surprise. And I didn't think I would have any chance of being a best uh, lecturer. I, uh, do I actually believe in that? We have so many good colleagues. But uh, it's really uh, nice to know that people appreciate the way I teach. Now I've got the prize, it doesn't mean that I will sit down and put my feet up uh, and, uh, you know, because I'm not going to get it again, I can just carry on until I'm pension. No, I want to keep going. I want to improve things. I want to make it more interesting, more pleasant for my students. I want them to learn as much as they possibly can. I want them to take this knowledge with them to the future. And I really want to be the one who is able to contribute to their future in this way. Thank you very much. Okay, many congratulations. Not bad for your career. Enough, I think. And I already said to you something about the CUT Award. CUT was a predecessor of mine, and uh, that was some 30 years ago. And an award was named after him, and this award is for 
one of our students or staff or a group of students or staff who are, have done something that is deemed to have been um, really good in research or teaching, and there's also a prize in money, 2,500 junos. And of course, we had to have some judges, Caroline Metzela, Pankas Halkodorn, Minka Holleman, and Rumsha Bamsi. And as the board, we asked them for some nominees. And there were 17 nominees for this award. And the judges were asked to um, make a short list. And of course, we also have only one winner for this award. So there are 16 that are great. So, you know, it's, you know, it's not very nice to say, oh, you're the runner up and that's it. So let's see what we can do with these other 16 excellent nominees, but one is the winner. And the winner is our colleague, Pedro Rodriguez dos Santos Rousseau. And it's only one man, even though there's lots of names. It's just one person, so mind you. Um, Pedro Rodriguez. Pedro Rodriguez, Rodriguez dos Santos something Russo is an astronomer. And he has the great drive to make this field known to other people, many other people, people who are not university students. And he was able within the group of astronomers that he works with to take that to people who are not students at universities, not former students. And I read a bit from the report of the judges. You don't know this yet, Pedro, but the CAF Award judges feel that this gentleman must win this award because he shares the knowledge of astronomy that he has with children, with adults in underdeveloped areas in order that they can become cognizant with science in the general sense, even though astronomy is not in their daily world, so to speak. And great, I, I feel it's great that you won this and you will get the 2,500 euros, of course, and I want to give this award to you, so maybe we should stand here too for that photo op. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today and receive this award. And um, I'll tell you a short story that uh, has more than 30 years ago. This image was taken in 1990 by the spacecraft Voyager 1. That small dot is us, our home, the planet Earth. When you look at Earth from space, the national borders vanish. Extreme ethnic or religious or even nationalistic views are difficult to support when we see our planet as a fragile planet. An ordinary planet, one among the thousands that we have been discovering in the last decades, thanks to astronomy. The sense of discovery and empathy are the key elements of the educational program Universe Awareness. Universe Awareness uses the beauty and grandeur of the universe to encourage very young children to have an interest in science and technology and foster their sense of global citizenship. Universe Awareness was founded here at Leiden University more than 10 years ago by Professor George Miley and now is an active network of more than 60 countries and more than 1,000 people all around the world, educators, teachers, astronomers, to really bring science and technology closer to young children. For the last years, my group, Astronomy and Society, 
have built on this success, and we are now implementing a comprehensive list of projects from citizen science to astronomy for development, but always with a common goal, engaging the public society with research. It is important that we, the university community, realize that public participation in science is an essential part of what we do and is key to support these initiatives. These are not only nice to have, these are must to have. This award is also the confirmation of the support that I have received at Leiden Observatory, at the Department of Science Communication and Society, and I'm very thankful for that. But it's also recognition of the work of my friends, my colleagues at these groups and these departments that in the last years have been supporting what we do. So this award is also for them. Thank you so much. Beste collega's, we komen uh, en well, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming now to nearing the end of today's celebration. And as uh, usual, I would like to say a few words to you all here today. I've got two subjects I'd like to mention today. Two, there are two things that have been uh, on our program recently, the anglicization of our curriculum, of our education, and a few words about work pressure. This is something that Hester mentioned earlier, pressure of work on students, but also just as much for uh, staff here at Leiden University. Something about internationalization, first of all. What was quite interesting, it was a new text uh, from Yap and Iman. What, what was interesting to him then was about the, the, the balance. It's not all of one or all of another. It's not Europe and the world or Europe and some other contrast. It's a question of finding a balance between the two elements between the importance of cooperation within Europe in an increasingly complex world, but also cherishing our own language, our national identity, and our national norms and values, which is uh, something, of course, that's also uh, inextricably linked with uh, Brexit. So it's a question of finding a balance between all the things that are expected of us as a university. Perhaps I could come first of all to the international aspect of things. There has been even a court case about the anglicization of universities in the Netherlands. I think it went a little bit further than it might have had to do so. What are we going to do? Are we going to do everything in English? Are we going to then put our clogs on for the other side of things? I mean, wh where are we? Where are we going? I think that in Leiden we found a good balance. We say that our bachelor programs are in Dutch, unless, of course, it's a subject where it's fairly obvious that it could be done better in Dutch, international relations, uh, international studies involving international uh, students. I mean, that's a clear example. So in principle, bachelor programs are in Dutch, unless, but then when we come to master level, we turn it the other way around. At master's level, it will be uh, English unless it's uh, self-evident to do it in Dutch. Why have we chosen for English? It's because that's masters are tend to be linked to uh, research, and that tends to be internationally and in most areas uh, English speaking. But obviously, n things like notarial law and so on, we will keep in Dutch. So, Dutch speaking, bachelors, masters. English language, unless. So uh, that's the subject, but then we'd also look at the numbers of students. 
because of the debate, all seem to so seem to look at whether all the international students were kind of uh, were they or were they not pushing our Dutch students out, taking their places in, because we are expecting to have. 8 to 15 million international students with the growing world population. So there'll be 8 to 8 and 15 million uh, international students. And if you look at the Netherlands, all our universities are in the top 200 of the world, then it's fairly obvious that people want to head our way. So the question we have to look at is how many students can we accept? We've set a minimum level, and we know from scientific research that in an international program, in an English language program, you have to have about a, a third of your students as international students, between a quarter and a third, something like that. There's no point in doing international relations Chips, for example, international relations with 99 Dutch students and one and lone American. And then, of course, we've also looked at the upper limit. How many can we fit into our program? And we've said a maximum of about 50%. That would be the upper limit for international students. If you go beyond that, it gets rather complicated and you can actually start asking questions such as why should the Dutch taxpayer be paying for this particular program? So we've looked at somewhere between a, a third and a half. And that's good because we now have a clear idea of what we're going to do. Bachelor programs in English, masters in, the bachelor programs in Dutch, masters in English. And of course, we also have a national uh, task. Uh, the uh, former dean of the law faculty said that contrary to what people think, we are not an international university. We're a Dutch university, obviously, with a strong international orientation, but we are a Dutch university. We're in two Dutch cities. We're in a Dutch province of South Holland. And we're in a country where, just to take a random example, the citizens of Flevoland are paying just as much for the universities as the people from Leiden or The Hague. So that the, day, the idea that we're simply working for international students would not allow us to fulfill our double uh, remit, international and national. We are expected to be training future teachers, math teachers, history teachers, doctors, lawyers, and most of our students are being uh, trained to work in the Dutch environment. But we're not simply a national institution with a national task. You heard in the discussion between uh, Iman and Jaap de Hoopschepper how the world is changing. She's studying in the Netherlands, she's studying in London, she's got an international group of friends. The world is changing and it's very good that there are universities that bring together these various languages, cultures and ideas. They work together. Uh, they go for a beer together or they go for something else together. But for the future of the world, it is a good thing that uh, friendships are formed. And this is the way we train the best students for our future world. Very often the challenges we're facing are not national challenges, but international challenges. And therefore, it's good if we, at the basis, have had this uh, international uh, level of debate. So that's, of course, the balance we have to find between international and national. So there's a lot that we have to do, and I think 
all the uh, universities in our country realize that we ask a lot of our students, of our lectures, of our researchers. We've already uh, spoken about the position of the student, but I would like to add to that that pressure of work, pressure of studying is uh, an issue. I mean, you just look at uh, Japan, look at Korea, and the situation there in terms of burnout. We certainly don't want to have that level here. And I think we mustn't blow it up too far. So looking at you, students here today, it's up to you also to try and find your own work-life balance, if you like. And it's, I've seen things changed over the past 40 years, but people here at this university have always had to find a balance between studying and enjoying their lives. Uh, we have student societies, I mean, they're there for you. And one has to find this uh, balance in all the elements of your uh, life. And you have to find that we can help you as a university, but you have a role to play yourselves. You have to think about things, and you have to discuss it with each other to find the best balance. Hester mentioned this morning that, mentioned that this morning, we were, I think I can say, surprised by uh, words uh, from our minister, who's currently speaking in Tilburg University, about the binding uh, study recommendation. She thought we could kind of tone that down a bit. I did really did not expect to hear this. Maybe it's something that's come over from America. Information is tweeted, information at this level. And I must say there's a lot of unrest that this has caused. People are saying, what? What's happening? But the teacher, the, the minister has been saying that we can kind of tone things down a bit with the binding study recommendation. And the reason according to her, is that if you manage 45 of your 60 credits or study points, we can kind of bring it down a bit. I think that's actually a bit of a cheat. These five points here or there isn't really going to make a great difference. And of course, she's passing the buck to us. And uh, I understand that we're talking there about a political spin. That's a word I've learned since I've had dealings with the Hague and politicians. And I think uh, by shaving a few uh, points off the number you need to get would not change a great deal of things as far as we're concerned. But it is an idea maybe for students to kind of not have to work so hard. I mean, it's a spin. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a, a bit of a rotten trick to play on us, I think, to use older terminology. And uh, what we don't want to have is for you to say, the Minister of Education is saying that we can uh, take our foot off the, uh, the gas. No. <laughs> I've... Uh, seen students build up such a backlog of work by Christmas in their first year that they've never been able to catch up with it. You do have to do the work. You do have to take things seriously. And you do have to enjoy your uh, work and obviously the, the, the part-time jobs that you need to do as well. So please forget the, the credits, forget the points, just past your first year, when you go further than that, you can do work placements, you can do minors, you can have an international experience, so please make sure you don't have this kind of problem at the end of the autumn term. 
and realize that by looking for your own balance, you are not responsible for uh, reducing your pressure of work yourself. That's the situation for the students. But of course, the situation is not different for our lecturers, for our researchers. And I'm not, I'm not going to make a, a comparison whose situation is worse. But it's also uh, concerning to us that there is so much pressure on our lecturers and our researchers. It's really getting out of hand. I think we should have an answer to this, but we don't. It's not an easy um, solution that we're going to find. And this morning in the Financial Dagblad, there was an announcement that our universities are going to have to be uh, more aware of their financial uh, position and be aware of uh, possible uh, financial issues. We have uh, made good plans here at Leiden University and our aim is to try and reduce the pressure and sail closer to the wind uh, with regard to the financial position. But it's not, uh, as I said, uh, a question of no student numbers. I said that it's a very popular place. Everybody wants to come here. But that's not uh, the only thing. There are a number of research projects and papers that have to be done. It's not the uh, height of the pile of papers on your desk. It's the way that we all interact uh, with each other uh, as colleagues, working together, uh, an open cooperative culture. This is something that in Leiden has uh, concerned us over the past year. There have been a number of uh, incidents in the past year which has been not good for anybody, and they're really, there have only been losers. And I think we have to realize that we should put the accent on cooperation rather than competition. And there was an article in the Volkskrant newspaper last week which uh, said that we have to look and see whether it's a question of I at the university or we at the university. And I must say, this is a problem that isn't limited to Leiden. It's not limited to Dutch universities. It's a universal problem. All the ingredients are there for a very difficult cocktail of pressure of work, difficulty achieving the right level of cooperation, dealing with the huge competition that we face in all areas. Uh, it's because we're dealing here with very uh, articulate and intelligent people. And it's also linked to the peer review, the, the, the uh, critique that we have of each other. And sometimes it's really very uh, strong, strongly worded. And it has, you have to see whether it relates to work or whether it becomes personal, which is something to avoid. So that all these ingredients together bring us to a situation where, if we're not careful, we'll be creating a culture of uh, fear amongst certain groups or faculties. This isn't linked to pressure of work, but it does affect the way that we work and whether we can enjoy our work or whether it gives us sleepless nights. So here and throughout the Netherlands, and I think throughout the world, we all have to look at how we can move from the I to the we. And it's linked to the system we're all part of, the 
education system, the research system. Again, some people today have had a prize and other people haven't. Is that competition healthy? Are we moving entirely to winner takes it all? We have to look at how we move from I to we. And here, uh, this is something that the university is going to have to try and work on. In the 1st of October, we will be introducing the new code of scientific integrity, which has been written by all uh, universities and which all, which everybody's been able to uh, contribute to. And one of the uh, norms is to ensure that we have an open, safe, and inclusive research, research culture where the researchers discuss good research practices and discuss with each other when things don't go quite right. And this, I think, is something that we all want to achieve. I think we realize that this is not going to resolve all our problems. It's just a little start, if you like. But there are things that we must discuss, and this will bring us to doing that. However, what's very good, what's very positive, is that if we at Leiden work in the new project that has been set up by British universities in and who have invited other universities. I think we're the first from the Netherlands, and that's the British Healthy Universities Network. If you're a university with a social faculty and a medical faculty, then you can be part of this. So what we want to do is put together all the scientific knowledge and all the practical knowledge that we have in these uh, social sciences and medical faculties we want to make all this inf information available to ourselves, to the lecturers, to the students, to the researchers. So uh, we have uh, a number of uh, lead actors at the uni Leiden University, but what we want to do is offer courses to everybody, including myself, and I'm really looking forward to this, look at how we can deal with stress ourselves, because a lot of it is in ourselves. And we can deal with it ourselves in part, but we also need outside help. And I think we on the university board are very pleased that we are going to be able to do this. I think, ladies and gentlemen, what we need to do is strive to achieve a university that's in balance in a world that seems to be losing its equilibrium. Uh, if you read the weekend articles in the newspapers, the NRC thinks we should have less cooperation with industry. Others think we should have more cooperation with industry and business. The trial paper had a series of articles uh, really uh, very negative that universities are, are coming to the end of their useful lives. It's all become too difficult. It's all become too expensive. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not the sort of thing you want to be reading when you're opening your academic year. It's written. I mean, this. <laughs> we have some really good lecturers in this area, and some of them have had the university teaching prize, but it does tend to be a bit of a sort of a downer if you look too much at this as an outsider. But the words I want to leave you with that let's not pull everything apart, all the criticism we're being subject to. We've been here since 1575. We were founded here from that very pulpit which you see before you now. We've been here all that time and we're going to remain and also the spinning minister is somebody we can ignore for the time being. We need to work together and ensure that we can achieve something here. I think it's very important. That's what I wanted to you want to say to you. 1575, 
The, uh, there are mathematicians here today, I, I know, and you will have worked out on your fingers that next year we will be uh, uh, celebrating our 444th birthday. So we're going to do something with 444. And uh, we're going to sort of anticipate this 444th birthday. And uh, it's um, 444 Leiden and The Hague. And The Hague, yes. Yeah, yeah. But everybody's here, the uh, representative of the province. We're going to, in 444, not deal. We're not going to focus solely on the outside world, the international world. We're going to look at our own university task in this area, and I am sure we're going to make a spectacular year of this. I think I've covered absolutely everything that I wanted to say now. I want to wish all the students here present the best days of their lives. Keep an eye on yourselves, keep an eye on each other, and on behalf of everybody uh, at the university, I want to say that I hereby declare the academic year 2018-2019 open, and I invite you to come and celebrate this with a drink at the